next session, we're looking at the ESG agenda. It's a topic that will be familiar to many of you, whether you're in the room or watching virtually. We've really seen it take hold in recent years, uh, underpinned by such events as the Business Roundtable focus on stakeholder capitalism, um, which has driven rapidly increasing investor interest in this area. So I'd like to introduce my wonderful panelists. Um, right next to me is uh, AIA Associate Director of ESG, Mark De Silva. Hello. Welcome, Mark. Thank you. Next to Mark is Mary Leung, who's the Advocacy Head at the CFA Institute. Welcome, Mary. And furthest away from me is Patrick Yu, who's the Hong Kong GM at Fleischmann Hillard. Hello, Patrick. So thank you all for joining the session. I think we've got a really good mix of expertise for this discussion. We have uh, Mark representing the corporate viewpoint. Mary, of course, is really plugged into what investors um, are looking for, and Patrick, um, the communications angle and, and client counsel. But let's start with the basic question here. Um, what is driving the increasing interest and demand when it comes to ESG? Uh, and, and how, how the, the, the speed of that change, is it surprising? Um, is it surprising to any of you how, how quickly that's all changing? So Mark, if I could start with you, please. Sure, definitely. So we started off at AIA in 2017. And at the time, the questions we were receiving were primarily on our ESG disclosure. What is your environmental impact? Have you measured your social performance? What are your governance policies? Since then, it's accelerated uh, rapidly. Um, our stakeholders have grown from primarily a regulator and investor audience to our employees who increasingly ask us questions, are interested in our own ESG performance, to, to our customers, to our corporate customers, our retail customers, uh, and regulators, not just in leading uh, jurisdictions such as Hong Kong and Singapore, but increasingly so in places such as Indonesia and the Philippines. So we'll have our local business units come to us with a request for guidance on, well, how do we produce an ESG report? What is a meaningful diversity and inclusion policy? And how do we, how do we localize this based on what you're doing at group at the local level so it's relevant to us here in the Philippines? So it's a, been a very dynamic space driven by strong investor interest, growing regula regulation across the region, as well as just stakeholder demand from employees, customers. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's across the board. You wouldn't say it's any, any one particular group. Initially, it started off with investors because mm. uh, the evidence has increasingly shown that ESG performance is very much linked to long-term value creation. Mm -hmm. uh, so it started off with uh, those initial links, uh, and since then, it's been customers just very interested in what we're doing on climate change, or investors who wanted to know um, what our own climate policies are, or how we ourselves were uh, looking at things such as net zero or the Paris Agreement. Mm. Sure. Mary, how, how has the investor perspective changed here uh, in recent years? Because that seems to be a key driver. Absolutely. I think um, the key, the interesting thing is, um, I think over the last five, 10 years, there's been an increasing realization that return, reputation and risks are all interlinked. So therefore, and as Mark was alluding to, uh, investors are increasingly keen on um, identifying the non um, financial factors that may affect their returns. Um, uh, and, and I need to be really careful because, you know, you can have a host of ESG factors, but it's the materiality of those factors that will be important mm -hmm. when, you, when it comes to the assessment of risks and returns. And I absolutely think that the trend is only going, going to accelerate. Even pre-pandemic, um, climate change has captured a lot of our uh, uh, airwaves. Um, and I think as a result of the pandemic, I think a lot of um, uh, stakeholders have, and, and, and investors have increasingly realized that um, climate change turns up the probability of things like pandemics. And if you're not ready, if you're not treating your stakeholders right, then you've got a problem. Um, and in actual fact, uh, if you look at some of the uh, fund flow data, um, the, uh, the you know, ESG had a pretty good crisis. So um, last year when uh, markets kind of went into free fall overnight as a result of lockdowns, um, ESG indices outperformed traditional indices. Mm. Um, and therefore we're seeing, um, in, you know, renewed investor demand into some of these ESG products. So funds, fund flows have been very strong. It's lasted well into 2021. 
Um, and uh, we believe the trend is likely to continue. Now, having said that, I also want to talk about, you know, want to um, state that ESG is not a silver bullet. You know, just because you buy a product with uh, an investment product with ESG on the label, it doesn't mean that it will deliver what you're looking for. So as investors, as any investors, there's still also quite a bit of work that one can do in order to understand what sorts of products you're buying into. I'll stop there. No, no, I mean, it, it's, it's very interesting. I, I'll definitely come back to you um, on a couple of the points you raised. But Patrick, from your perspective, how are you seeing it uh, in terms of the clients you're counseling? And I guess in particular, in terms of C-suite awareness, yeah, we have seen an increasing interest from a C-level executive in terms of putting ESG as their core strategy you know, of the company. Um, before that, we see more from Hong Kong, Singapore and Australia. But in the past few years, we see more interest from Japan, Korea, even China. Recently, our Korea team actually helped advise the government in terms of legislation of board diversity of many listed companies in Korea, because surprisingly, a lot of the listed companies in Korea, they don't have any female representative. So there's a huge effort in terms of, you know, helping the diversity in the board as well. We recently also see China. Um, we have recently a report on asset management. 95% of the investors believe that, you know, the company that, you know, they buy the product should have an ESG commitment to demonstrate, you know, their efforts in helping on climate change, you know, carbon neutrality and different kind of, you know, social impact as well. So we definitely see the change in terms of not only just on reporting, because many things, People think that communication only on the reporting on annual reports, but right now they really see the impact in you know, how they can use the ESG as a strategy to influence and also connect with the stakeholders, investors, and the target audience as well. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned reporting, and, and Mark, you also mentioned uh, the disclosure um, requirements and standards. How much of this is being driven by um, higher standards, and is there a risk that it just becomes a a compliance issue versus an issue of, of real change? That is a, that's a good question. Um, I think it always starts off as a compliance matter. That is the first, the first push. So you'll have corporates looking at for the first time, what is their environmental footprint, begin to calculate that, looking at the social, um, demonstrating their social policies to their stakeholders. And then from there, it becomes a broader question as to, well, how do we generate more value in this disclosure? How do we compare ourselves relative to our peers? What is the mark of differentiating? What are the differentiators here within our story? What's our unique sustainability story? And then from there, I think there, you start to get more interest, more traction internally with your stakeholders. And someone asks the question, well, how do we amplify this further? And then based on, um, it, it really sort of snowballs from there. Mm. Uh, it becomes, and multiple stories in some cases, you have a report and disclosure that becomes relevant to your investor audience. You're telling that one particular story. And then you look at, well, how do I make the story better relevant to our employees? Because your employees are not going to be reading an ES report of what's now 150, 200 pages. So, so you'll need to distill that story down to make it relevant to your employees, customers, uh, or other audiences. So it becomes a, a broader story of how are we telling our own story of how we are creating value um, to our various different stakeholder groups. So you start to see the inherent value in reporting from that first compliance push. Mm, interesting. Mary, do you see it the same way? Does it start with compliance and, and get bigger or, or can it, is it sometimes, or is it still too often just compliance? Well, um, I'm going to be optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, a couple of years back, um, we um, looked at um, ESG disclosure regimes uh, across markets in uh, Asia Pacific. And what we found uh, that was uh, even though some markets already have been um, requiring or mandating uh, ESG disclosures from issuers, those are actually not the markets that have the best disclosures. Mm. In actual fact, um, the markets that have the best disclosures tended to be the ones that had the most vocal investors like asset owners or pension funds. So I think there are a number of ways mm. to look at the problem. Of course, if the market is not there, then absolutely re regulators should come in and you know, re request some level of um, disclosures. And, and by the way, disclosures are great. Sunlight is the best disinfectant. Um, but if the market, so, you know, I think market solutions are always the best. If the market's not there yet, yes, then uh, regulators has, has, has a role to play. Um, and I think increasingly they would want to um, mandate uh, certain uh, issue, disclosures of certain issues when it comes to systemic risks, such as climate change. 
So those two are um, kind of part and parcel um, of kind of the solution. I think if um, it's a, if it's if, if it's solely driven out of regulatory requirements, then it becomes a compliance issue. Um, and people just tick the box. You know, they've done it, the regulators off my back, done, right? And they forget the value piece, they forget the communication piece and how they're telling the story. Mm -hmm. But if, um, so, so my personal take on this is that if we can paint this as a win-win-win situation, then that's where you will see the most traction. So who are the winning parties? So we, we can, if we can say, look, you, if you're doing this right, then um, investors will love you. You are um, uh, lowering your cost of capital. You're diversifying your capital base. That's, that's a win. So that's the market side. Oh, by the way, it will also help you achieve your regulatory compliance tick box exercise. Another, another win. By the way, do you know it's also the right thing to do because you're showing, you know, your uh, uh, how attuned you are to your stakeholders, win, win, win. And I think that's how, you know, as part of the ecosystem, we should be relaying the message, uh, not just to Mark, because he's converted. We, uh, we, we don't need to preach, need, need to be preaching to the converted, but people who are maybe, you know, at, you know, on, at, at, the, at the beginning of their journey. And this is why a stakeholder engagement is a very important part of the process. You have to know who your stakeholders are and the information that they require in order to produce, to identify the value in reporting and to create a document of value in mm -hmm. itself. So just looking at the, the communications angle, you both touched on it. Um, Patrick, from your perspective, how um, difficult is it to take that ESG strategy, turn it into an easily digestible story that can work for the various people that, that kind of uh, need to hear it. I think I'll echo to what Mary Mark mentioned is before that is really on taking the box, you know, compliance. But right now, I think whether you are a listed company, whether you're asset manager, asset owners, you actually have a 360 degree demand and push factor from your investors, you know, NGO group and different type of consulting firm. Um, so I, I think the C-level, you know, executive have already kind of received it, but how they communicate, I think is go beyond that, you know, annual reporting, because that's really important. But what we have seen right now is, you know, apart from the ESG report, we have seen ESG investor call, you know, regular call analyst meeting to talk about their ESG commitments. Recently, we have already seen some clients, they actually have ESG products to, you know, show that they are actually commit beyond, you know, the target that they reach, you know, to meet certain targets. So I think right now is actually a good timing, you know, the company that use this kind of messaging to differentiate themselves. Mm. You know, if I'm going to buy your product and I'm going to invest your company, you know, what you can go beyond just the standard reporting, because I'm sure we all know that, you know, ESG is more, you know, advanced or, you know, more popular in the EU, but right now, I think in Asia, we have been catching up really, really aggressively. And mm -hmm. I think that's a good sign for everyone to take it, you know, further. And also it's more about the internal education. You know, you can talk a lot of things to stakeholders, but the management cascade it to the internal employee, everyone, so that they really take the action rather than just, you know, saying what they're doing, but not really competing the boss. I'm sure you have heard about the term greenwashing. Mm -hmm. So nobody wants to be labeled in that kind of concept anymore. Well, let's let's talk about that actually. So I don't know if ESG washing is is a term, but um, how much of a risk is that uh, when we talk about the kind of various ESG narratives that are out there? Um, uh, Mark, from your perspective, I mean, obviously you, you're you're bringing quite a lot of rigor to it, but but do you see when you look at the market at large, do, do you see that as a risk? Yes, I think this is why there needs to be consistency and alignment in consistently consistency alignment and also assurance when it comes to disclosure. I think that definitely helps. Mm -hmm. That way, it creates a, it, it looks to standardize what are your disclosures, what are your metrics, and we strongly encourage. This is a process that we have internally, making sure that all your disclosures are vetted, mm -hmm. uh, they're verified, and where possible assured, so that there is a rigor to it. There's consistency, and you're comfortable with what you're sharing. Uh, on the broader statements with greenwashing, um, there's there's definitely a certain amount of it in the market, I have to say. 
Uh, but I feel, feel that we are now dealing with stakeholders that are increasingly more sophisticated when it comes to assessing, scrutinizing um, your claims and your stories. So it mm. could it could be a potential risk, to be honest. Yeah, sure. Mary, your thoughts on that? Is, um, is there enough rigor or, uh, or, is, or, or not? Um, so probably let me shift my perspective a little bit. Um, obviously, a lot of our um, members at the CFA Institute are portfolio managers and, and analysts. Um, and we have a particular interest in the uh, financial services industry. Um, in, in the industry, a lot of these products get sold. Um, and greenwashing is definitely an issue. So I'm not talking about issuer disclosures. Now I'm talking about product disclosures as it relates to investment products. Mm -hmm. um, and um, what I can say is that regulators, both in um, this region uh, and globally, are increasingly scrutinized claims being made by funds, by asset managers about their ESG units of their products. And um, so whether, um, you know, whether you like it or not, I think there will be further regulations coming down our way uh, in terms of um, on how asset managers and how investment products are, um, uh, you know, uh, how they portray themselves. If they wanted to say they are green or sustainable or ESG fund, what criteria they have to meet, what sort of strategies are they employing, um, and so, what sort of um, ESG information they are incorporating in, into their decision-making process. Um, in fact, ESG um, CFA Institute is also working on a, a global voluntary standard that will help asset managers articulate how their investment products will fit in uh, uh, into some of these uh, in ESG disclosures. Um, uh, you know, I, I think um, greenwashing is not something to be sneezed at because the whole basis of the financial service industry is on trust. Like you go out, you buy a product, you believe that it will um, deliver what it claims to deliver. And I think once that trust is gone, um, we are um, probably in a, going to be in a very sticky situation. And I think we have been in those <laughs> sticky situations before, you know, like, like, like in the uh, global financial crisis. So I think it is um, absolutely critical that collectively we work towards um, raising disclosure standards as it comes to uh, financial products um, and making sure that uh, not only are you you know, disclosing the right information about the product, but the intermediary who may be you know, selling your product on your behalf, understand what that product is and also understand what the client is looking for. So if you look at a green product, would you be surprised that there's an oil and gas stock in it? Maybe, right? Or if there is a tech stock in your ESG fund, would you be surprised? You know, things like that. There may be good reasons why you see an oil and gas stock in your sustainable fund, um, but without that, um, without those transparency, without those disclosures, then I think um, uh, the end client may, may be disappointed and may decide not to trust uh, the system anymore. And, and I think that's, that would be a very, very big problem. Just to add on that point, I think it was a great example of this was in their lab just a few weeks ago with DWS, <laughs> and, and they had a very tangible decrease in their share mm. price right yeah. then and there. And the, the other thing that has, has been noticeable is, you know, in the mainstream media, there's been you know, something of a backlash um, about, uh, you know, ESG funds, ESG products, um, with, you know, many suggest, not many, but some suggesting that, that um, these products are not all they're cracked up to be. Mm. Uh, and, and, you know, they don't meet or fulfill kind of some of the criteria they uh, claim that they do. D does that angle in terms of the media narrative around ESG surprise any of you? And, and does it pose a challenge at all? I, I think what we have seen is um, you have seen more reporters. They actually have a real deep dive knowledge on ESG. Mm -hmm. So they will, like what you mentioned, they will challenge, you know, the disclosure, transparency, whether to take, you know, or the green elements. I think for us is like what Mary mentioned is really the trust and transparency. You know, you can talk a lot, you know, what you're doing, blah, blah, blah. But I think it's really how when you disclose, you know, your strategy, your product, you really take the action. And then you really demonstrate the commitment, you know, that's why what I mean is the regular reporting. 
you know, keep on the holistic communication externally, internally, so that really people can see your commitment. Because I think this COVID actually helped pivot a little bit on the conversation before it's all about environment. Mm -hmm. But right now we talk about social, social impact, and then we talk about governance, diversity, you know, and, you know different type of issue. Then that would really help to change the narrative from some of the companies because I think most of the companies, what I see and what we advise the client is, you have to take all the bosses for ESG, not just you know because I know there are lots of you know mandate about the carbon neutrality, which is important, but still you know governance, you know corporate governance, you know social impact, especially after COVID, I think whether the company is socially responsible is something that a lot of stakeholders will take really seriously about. Mm. Well, it's an interesting point, isn't it? Because we, we talk about ESG as one thing yeah. when it's it's three things. And of course, it's many, many things within those three buckets. Um, how do they kind of, I suppose, how do you weigh them up? Are there areas that are being overlooked, uh, Mark, when you're looking at ESG, for example, is, is, is S not being afforded the attention it deserves or G? Interesting question. Um... So I'll answer this question with, from a more of an investor perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, this is where I think the topic of materiality is quite important. Looking at a company, looking at an issuer, when you're making an investment decision, you'll need to look at what are the material ESG issues it, the company is going to be faced with, what are the relevant environmental factors that might pose a risk to your long-term investment in the company. What are the social factors that would uh, enable better decision-making? Is that greater diversity, for example? Or when it comes to governance, how effective is the company being from a governance perspective? So I think good practice is that you need to look at what are the material issues to the company and looking at, in addition to all these other factors that would ultimately enable you to make it, uh, an, an accurate assessment on whether the company is going to be sustainable long term. So it should be looked at together holistically. Mm -hmm. uh, whether that's been the case in the market, currently there's a stronger focus on the E. And mm -hmm. I think historically, there's been a greater focus on good governance, perhaps in as aspects of, uh, social, uh, of, of, um, of social inclusion, for example, but on the environmental front, much less so. So that's why we've seen a greater focus on climate. You've had um, the task force on climate-related financial disclosures issue a framework for companies to provide consistency in how they're disclosing their climate impact, climate risks. So I think that's why there's been a current focus on the, on the E, but that does not, or in my view is that it, it should not come at the expense of these other factors that again, very much contribute to the long-term sustainability of the company. Mm. Mary, what are your, what are your thoughts? I there? have two answers for you. Mm -hmm. One's the easy answer. The easy answer is they're all important. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, my, my own personal favorite answer is um, in this region, um, and by the way, they are all important. Um, in this region, I would focus on the G. Mm -hmm. And the reason is um, Asia Pacific has very interesting ownership characteristics. So if you look at a listed issuer, very often they are dominated by a controlling shareholder, be they in the form of a single individual, a family, um, a, another corporation, um, uh, and maybe even a state or you know, a government. So getting the governance piece right in a region where controlling shareholders are the norm is very important in terms of investor protection. So, um, and, and as Mark said, um, governance probably has the longest track record in terms of uh, its relationship with delivering alpha. So I always look at the uh, governance piece. And if they, if a so what does governance mean, right? It basically means how um, decisions are made within a, a company. And I think if they can get that right, if there is enough um, independence on the board, if they have they open minded and can be inclusive about um, different opinions, they di you know they have uh, diversity not just in gender but in uh, age, in in terms of background and skill set, then I think that company is, is actually you know, quite nicely set up to to steer itself through the um, challenges that's the twenty first century. So I. Um, I personally think that governance is the most important, but absolutely, I think your question is right because when we go out and look at you know, ESG ratings um, or ESG products, um, they may have different methodology, and there may not be the right you know there may not be an absolute right answer. Um, the key then is for there to be enough knowledge and education um, by the user 
to understand what they're looking at and to basically look under the hood and see um, and understand the methodology of some of these products that are being shown to them. Mm. Um, we've got about seven minutes left, so I wanted to see, first of all, if there are any questions in the room. Ah, oh, Sim, um, do we have a, we've got a mic. Not that you really need it, but uh, go yes. ahead anyway. No, thanks. thanks for Okay, thanks for reading. It's my masters, muffling everything. Um, hi, everybody. ESG is um, is a bit of a passion point for me as well, too. As for, well, for some of my clients, I'm Simeon from Ketchum. Um, one thing I'm constantly re uh, re wrestling with, and I'm interested with the panel's um, uh, thoughts on this, it does come down to that weighting issue. You know, I kind of think that it's interesting, Mary, you, you raise governance as the number one issue for Asia. But, and I agree with Mark as well, too, that the poster child for ESG is E um, at, at the moment for it. But we're all communicators, and so communicating ESG, uh, ESG is a, is a company policy, as you, know, as, you, as, you, as you describe, but we're communicators, and then for communicating um, ESG, therefore also becomes a challenge in terms of when to communicate, how to communicate, because, Arun, as you mentioned, ESG washing is a term. Mm -hmm. And um, so there is a, you know, there's a risk of over-communicating, and uh, so, is there a is there a, a framework or a yardstick in terms of when and how to communicate uh, ESG to do it either proactively or should it be passively? Um, so when it, when it, when are the moments in time to uh, to be communicating this and to be able to make a difference and prove your you know um, prove your quality in this in this particular area? Okay, who wants that one? Oh, uh, let me take that. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, that's a good point, whether you over-communicate or under-communicate. I, I think um, right now what we have seen is the annual like ESG report. We have seen stewardship reports, CSR report, different type of, you know, communications. But what we always advise the client is, um, you know, take every opportunity that you think is appropriate. Like you have earnings call, quarterly basis, show you have a you know, ESG session or whether you can have tailor-made ESG investor day or media day because Every time when we work with different clients, asset managers, asset owners, or listed company, we got questions from the investors and media about your ESG commitment. Then, so I think you need to have that kind of regular commitment. I'm not saying you have to do all the time. I think there are certain, you know, practice that you can do on a quarterly basis or half yearly basis so that people can see your progress, you know, because there are a lot of targets that, you know, company need to meet about, you know, carbon neutrality, you know, about, you know, climate change and so on. But people really need to see in the progress because there are some third party auditor. Actually, we see that they will publish report to challenge some of the asset manager companies. They actually did not meet certain targets. So I think that kind of more holistic communication that people expect, you know, next analyst call, then you have some progress. I think that will be a good starting point. And then obviously in different jurisdictions, EU, you know, Asia and also in the US, they will have different requirements as well. So you have to follow what, what is happening and what you can communicate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mark, Mary, did you want to add anything? I think it's really, really, it's an exercise in constant communication. And if you don't tell your story, if you're not proactive about it, uh, your stakeholders are going to assume that there are gaps or inadequacies in your story. And I raised the example of rating agencies, uh, MSCI, Sustainalytics, they have particularly have particular requirements when it comes to comms, external comms. And if you don't tell that story, or if you don't, they'll just assume, they'll, they will assume that you don't have a particular policy or practice in place. And that impacts then the assessment of your company, uh, which is shared with key stakeholders, which are primarily your investors. So investors are getting a story that's not complete or accurate. And then internal, and then there are, there are NGOs as well who look through your disclosure. Uh, again, if they don't see a policy or practice in place, they might assume that it's not uh, an initiative, initiative or a practice that you currently have. Same with your employees. If you, especially right now, your employees want to know what you're doing in regard to ESG. They want that story to be disseminated to them in a way that's, uh, that's understood, that's relevant. Uh, so I think it's a constant exercise of communicating to your external stakeholders and internal stakeholders on, on various aspects of your ESG story. Well said, I, I don't have anything okay. to add. Sure. All right. Any more questions? Adam. Hi, Adam. Adam here. Um, so we're about to have COP26 and, you know, talk about the, the net zero goals from mid-century and how we're going to get there. But 
any chance of achieving net zero is going to depend on some very carbon intensive industries reducing their emissions output. So, you know, industrial processes like cement making and, and, and so on. <clears throat> if a cement maker or a steel maker showed up in an ESG portfolio today, people would say, well, that, that doesn't really fit because they're so carbon intensive. But these companies <clears throat> obviously need a lot of financing to make the transition from being very carbon intensive to net zero. So how do we tell a slightly more complex and nuanced stories here about companies that are not very ESG friendly now, but need to attract financing in a world where capital is increasingly ESG focused in order to make that transition? So Adam was looking at me. And it was, um, uh, we saved the toughest to, la to the last, right? Um, I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, but <laughs> there are a number of ways to, to answer your question. So um, there are transition bonds out there, which will help you know, companies uh, in um, carbon intensive sectors to transition into something else, right? Nobody can, I don't think it's realistic to expect that we're all going to be green like overnight. So there needs to be some transition. And, and there are some, there, there is some, um, there's some instruments out there that will allow um, uh, 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 companies to do so. But, you know, but obviously, you know, um, uh, and that brings, so I'm sidetracking, but, you know, gas, is gas, you know, a green, um, it should, should gas be in the EU green taxonomy? And that's, that's a perennial question. Anyway, um, but I think the importance is um, the way ESG integrate, you know, ESG is defined can also have an impact on whether these companies make their ways into the portfolios. If we look at um, there are a number of um, there are num there are very uh, there are quite a few different sustainable investment strategies. If we look at ESG integration, we are talking about integrating material ESG factors into the investment process. Um, and actually, in in under that umbrella, you don't actually have to exclude certain sectors or certain companies. What you're trying to do is in integrate those factors. And if you decide that the steel or cement company that you are buying is actually um, uh, doing quite a lot in terms of decarbonizing and the valuation is actually looking pretty decent, you can incorporate it into the portfolio. However, if um, your strategy is to make an impact or if your strategy is to look at um, exclusions, then maybe um, a company like that would not have, um, uh, would not have a, a, a spot in that portfolio. So it depends on you know, the portfolio's objectives, it depends on the client's objectives and what, basically how you are going about that investment management process. And I think it's also important to uh, note that um, if we are um, serious about decarbonization, then sooner or later, we have to put a price on carbon. And this is where I think um, we're all very behind. <laughs> um, I know that there are some uh, jurisdictions in this part of the world that have uh, an active um, carbon market, um, and we know that Mingnan has just started uh, launching one. Um, I think this is absolutely the right way to go. Without a proper price on carbon, uh, we're just going to go merrily on without really changing behavior. Um, and we saw over the, over the summer that the EU has announced uh, uh, the potential for a carbon border adjustment me mechanism, CBAM, and uh, which means that if um, you are exporting into Europe. Um, and th the origin of the export does not have the same carbon tariffs, then they can put the tariff on it. And I think that will, obviously it's an, a few years before that's um, going to happen, if at all. Um, but I think that's instructive on where, um, what the trend is and what some of um, the, what some, gov what some, some of the thinking behind, you know, uh, government, policies and actions. And even if you don't, by the way, I think even if you don't believe, believe in climate change, and I know that not many people, no, some people don't, even if you don't think climate change is real, the policies that some of these governments are implementing, they are real. They will hit your bottom line at some mm. stage. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. That was a really very comprehensive answer. Um, so we're, we're out of time, unfortunately. I feel like we could, we could keep going here, um, but we must move on to our next session. So we will be back shortly.